Hello and thank you for listening to our presentation this afternoon where we're offering for discussion issues related to ethics and autoethnography. I'm Val and I'm a senior lecturer in social work at the University of Chester in Northwest England and I'm a keen autoethnographer, often drawing on my experiences as a parent of a daughter with a severe learning disability to research, um, explore and articulate issues relating to family carers. I'm acutely aware of the need to act ethically and I struggle at times with the often blurred line between telling a story and protecting identity. As I'm sure people here know, autoethnography isn't always taken as seriously as it might be. As a method and methodology, it's critiqued by some um, and seen as being incoherent, as lazy and as not being proper research. So perhaps one such way for it to be viewed as a, a credible research method is for autoethnography to adhere to proportionate guidelines um, to protect researchers and participants, recognising of course that they, they may well be one and the same. So the Northwest Autoethnography Group, NWAG, have debated um, and discussed these issues in depth and we've drawn on the excellent work by Tollick and by Sykes um, and I'm going to expand on the next slide in detail before Chris will talk about her, recent, her recent work um, and talk through some of the issues apparent within relational ethics within such work. Unfortunately, time does not allow me to, uh, to go into detail regarding Martin Tollick's foundational guidelines or Pat Sykes' ethical considerations, but references for both are available in the final slide. Um, autoethnography can be a vibrant and adaptable research method, and therefore guidelines and considerations need to be flexible uh, and on a continuum allowing room for a creative space to emerge and to develop. One way we've found at the Northwest Autoethnography Group of supporting and developing ethical considerations is um, to build obviously on the previously stated guidelines, but also consider use of a supportive group. Now, whether, that's in, uh, that, whether that involves uh, working on a collaboration, a collaborative autoethnography, or whether by using a type of group coaching methodology, um, for example, action learning sets, that's quite familiar for social work education and reflective practice. Um, and that asks the questions and considerations of what, why and how are you doing what you're doing. Uh, and this can lead to a more deeper or a deeper and a more thoughtfully produced piece of research as well as potentially silencing uh, critics who accuse autoethnographers of navel-gazing. Now, just as process consent should be an integral part of research to make sure participants still want to be part of the project, um, surely questions uh, of ethics must include respect for self. So by consulting with others may also support you as an autoethnographer to maintain ethical practice and also take time to think about the work you're doing, the work you're undertaking. For example, is this the right time? Is this the right time to do this piece of research? And are you, um, are you depicting yourself as well as those people who are the focus of your research respectfully? Hello, my name is Chris. I work at the Faculty of Education at Edge Hill University in the professional learning department. I'm an adoptee, adoptive mother and birth daughter and that's where my autoethnographic decisions have been based uh, so far. In considering ethical decisions I considered, like Harris, I agree to some extent that I have been decontextualised from my birth culture. Herein lies a fundamental problem for me and other adoptees. I'm a member of two cultures, adoptive and birth, yet the disconnection, even alienation from some members of my adoptive and birth culture influences how and what I write. 
So in speaking to the first point, I've attempted to ensure that my moral choices are not secreted away, buried, concealed and hidden from public scrutiny. However, that's difficult. Exposing secrets is difficult. So I, I try to expose dilemmas as I write to try and hopefully protect my kin past, present, birth and adoptive. Yet in deciding how and what to write, I know I compromise some aspects of myself in the past. Writing a layered analytic autoethnography, I potentially oppressed fragments of myself that might be stolen through adoption. Fragments that I strive to recognise. So I started to ask myself, how do my birth and adoptive selves fuse? As Harris says, being an adoptee means that part of myself has been stolen. Most recently, I have found inspiration in Peleus' book, The Creative Qualitative Researcher, Writing That Makes Readers Want to Read, 2019. I have begun to recognise four aspects of myself which have delineated my ethical boundaries. The disruptive self, the diminished self, the confessional self, the critical self, and the testifying self. The first sparks driving me to autoethnographic writing came from a disruptive and diminished self. Disruption caused by family breakdown, separation, divorce, and death of my adoptive mother diminished and destabilized me. How could I reveal my pain? when it meant mirroring and revealing the pain of my kin. As an adoptive mother and birth daughter, I sought to engage in open dialogue with kin, as, as Tolik suggests. Yet some kin had buried their willingness for dialogue too deeply for me to reach. In my attempt to prevent a deepening of relational damage, I kept some kinship interaction secret reminding myself that distance promises to keep the heart safe, as Harris said. Eventually writing from my critical self enabled me to take a stance. For example, I challenged micro-assaults and the symbolic violence in naming adoptive motherhood as unreal. I could show family interactions through employing a confessional or testifying self but this could induce vulnerability for me and my kin, like an inked tattoo, as Tolik said. I'm uncomfortable in doing this. How is this an ethics of care? My birth father once said to me that I was brave in finding him. Yet my bravery does not extend to testifying publicly as a birth daughter and in opposition to his contrasting belief to keep our genetic connection secret. To date, I have not sought to publish writing that I would not be prepared to show him first, as Tolik suggests. Instead, I learned to celebrate the cultural connections between myself and my birth father, celebrating my connection to others, as Tolik suggests. Yet my ethical decisions were not without threats to myself. I wonder what are the consequences in exposing members of my fragmented and estranged family? What are the consequences for me? I find myself diving deeper and deeper towards the postmodern, the abstract, the poetic, in obscuring and de-identifying others. I am inspired by autoethnographic writers around me and I strive for my readers to make their own conclusions from what I write. As Val said earlier, the Northwest Autoethnography Group is a keen group of like-minded individuals involved in supporting each other through collaborations, group coaching and action learning sets.
thank you for listening to our presentation and we're looking forward to your questions.